Hi guys, welcome back. This is uh, chapter seven. Here we're going to be talking about viruses and prions. Hopefully you guys find this a little bit interesting. This stuff is my jam. So yeah. Yeah, don't don't make that noise to me. Okay, these are our learning outcomes for the chapter. You know the drill with these by now. Um, yeah, this is what you're expected to learn. Viruses can infect literally anything. <laughs> so there's that. There's that answer. So, uh, viruses, are they alive? Technically, no. We're going to say no for the sake of this course. Um, we would consider them, you know, um, not necessarily alive. But if you were to kill, quote unquote, viruses, they're inactivating them, not killing because they were never alive to begin with. So that's the only argument there. But um, so technically not. There's a Viruses seem to have played a massive role in the evolution of life. It seems like there's a lot of viral DNA uh, in our genome that they aren't active viruses, but then were later incorporated as just part of our genome, which is pretty interesting. Um, and that's true for a lot of organisms. So they seem to have um, had a huge role in the evolution of life and likely came before cells, right? That makes sense too. So uh, what are like we're gonna get into their distinctive biological characteristics, uh, their parts, you know, what they're they're made of and everything like that. Um, so yeah, we're we're gonna get into all this as we go. Um, so yeah, we usually talk about them as active or inactive instead of living or dead. Um, they can take control of certain life processes of cells, but they themselves cannot exist without the host. So they are obligate intracellular parasites. So that's the term that you would apply to them. Um, these guys are obligate, which means they have to do it, intracellular, which means inside of the cell, and they're parasites, meaning that they will utilize stuff at our detriment, right? So obligate, intracellular, parasite. Yeah. Right, so that it seems like between 40 and 80%, listen to that, 40 to 80%, 80%, man of the human genome may be remnants of ancient viral infections. That is kind of terrifying when you think about it. Uh, but yeah, a lot of our genome actually doesn't go for anything <laughs> that we know of, right? So there's a lot yet to learn about um, our genes and how they function for us as humans. But yeah, it seems like a lot of it came from viruses and that's legit, that is true. So viruses themselves are also part of our biome. Uh, part of our normal, you know, things that live on us or exist on us or in us um, and have a part to play in how we live our lives. So we're going to talk about um, viruses as we go. I'm not going to get too much into detail with this um, right now, but these are the properties of viruses. This is a good one to come back to whenever you guys are studying um, and looking at uh, what you need to know or want to know about viruses in general. But um, yeah. We're going to go through all of this. So there's a wide range of size for viruses. Uh, the smallest ones, parvoviruses, 0.2 micrometer, 0.02, excuse me, micrometers in diameter, up to Pandora virus that are as big as an actual Streptococcus bacterium um, that you can literally see with a light microscope. Cylindrical viruses um, are very, very long, but they're going to be very narrow. So we're talking about things like... Um, Ebola virus, and those are really, really long, but very narrow. So we usually look for these guys using electron microscopes, right? They shoot little tiny electrons at things and allow us to see the smallest of the small things in detail. So that's the only way we can really look at these. So this is just showing us in scale some viruses and how they would fall into um, place with the size of bacteria as well as a eukaryotic cell. Our eukaryotic cell that we're looking at here is a yeast cell. So this is a single cell, right? And this is a bud that would be coming off a new cell. Um, so we have uh, E. coli up here. So it's our basic base that we usually build off of, um, you know, microbiology wise. Then we have the streptococcus bacterial cell. And here's our Pandora virus, which is just so large. And so is the Mimi virus. They're both very large. Um, and these are rickettsia bacteria, which are definitely smaller than both of those viruses. And then we go on down the line. We can break it down um, to size where we look at yellow fever virus over here. Um, we took a look at some of the bacteriophage, HIV, and whatever. Um, and then we have hemoglobin. That's an actual hemoglobin molecule. And look at the size of a hemoglobin molecule, just hemoglobin, and the size of yellow fever virus. 
It's pretty crazy. So they don't look at all or resemble cells. They don't function like cells. There's really nothing about these guys, about viruses that are like cells at all. We, the only thing that they absolutely must have, they have to have an external coating of some kind. We call this a capsid. And then uh, we have to have a core that contains the nucleic acid. So those are the things that you need. The capsid, that's the coating, the nucleic acid. That's their genetic material. Okay. I don't care. Um, so yes, yeah, so we got into that. So that's the 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 outside, the, the covering is the capsid. And the nucleic acid is what's on the inside. So that's the genome, right? We know it's DNA or RNA. And it can be all different kinds, and we're gonna get into what how that works for them. Sometimes they have enzymes that they will package up with them. Sometimes they steal those enzymes from the host. Sometimes they have genes for those enzymes that they will pack up. Um, for example, like um, uh, HIV and a reverse transcriptase. Okay. Oh, oh, right. That's all right. I clicked on the thing. I apologize. Okay. So our components, the capsid, that's our shell that surrounds the nucleic acid. You have to have one. All viruses have it. Definitely have. Um, and then when you have that shell around your nucleic acid and you have just that, just those two things, that's our nucleocapsid or nucleocapsid. That's the capsid, that's our coating, and the nucleic acid together. Now, What's the difference here and how are we going to compare? Like, you're like, okay, cool. So, the, but those are always together. Yes, those, we always have that. But we also can have an envelope. We usually steal the host cell membrane for these. They don't make their own. It's usually the host cell membrane or the virus or the, um, sorry, uh, nuclear membrane. So the nucleus, they can actually steal the membrane from the nucleus or from the outside of the cell. It just depends on the virus. But Anyways, so um, we modify the host cell membrane so that it has only the virus uh, proteins on the outside of it. And then we just push our way out and bud out. So it's just like encloses around and pinches off. And then the new virus goes off into living its wonderful life out of that cell. As better than what bacteria get, they always burst open. They don't ever bud. So we got a better deal there. Right. Um, Envelope, not all viruses. Okay, that's important. All of them, yes, all, all have a capsid, all have a genome. Uh, so they all have to have that. So they all have a nucleocapsid, but the envelope, not all of them have that. Okay, so if they have that host membrane wrapped around them, that's the envelope. That's a special membrane wrapped around them. If they do not have, if they lack it, they are called naked. Many viruses don't have an envelope, so they are naked viruses. Spikes, you got to have this to get in to the host. These are going to be found on naked and enveloped. They have to get in somehow. These are proteins or glycoproteins, so sugar plus protein, that allow the virus to get in to the cell. So think of the cell as having a bunch of doors on its surface and each individual virus has figured out how to hijack at least one of those doors. And this glycoprotein spike is what allows them to do that, to hijack that system. So that's how they dock with host cells. So, um, so the virion is a term for any fully formed virus that can cause an infection. So they can, um, like if you're naked over here on the left or enveloped here on the right, see how they have their own capsid going on in here um, with these guys here. So these, these, these units that are making up all of this are called capsomeres. There's repeating units that make up the capsid. Anyways, so um, that's the capsid in there and surrounding our nucleic acid. So that makes this the nucleocapsid. And that's surrounded by our um, envelope that it stole from the host and has studded with its little protein spikes, right? Our glycoprotein spikes that allow us to get in. So the next cell, it was weird. I feel like it skipped, but it didn't. 
Look at capsomeres. Again, those are the repeating subunits that, fo that form on their own the capsid. Okay, they come together to form the capsid just on their own. They don't need help doing it. It's just how their shape works. You can have a helical capsid or an icosahedral capsid. We just looked at the icosahedral. What we know what this means, this has made up of triangles. That's all you need to know about it, okay? Triangles over and over again around into it almost like um, almost like a sphere, but not quite, right? Because it's, it's got triangles. So about 20 sides um, with 12 corners. That's, that's an icosahedron. Um, the helical capsid is kind of, you're going to see, let me just show it to you, but it's a continuous um, helical uh, setup of the capsomeres around the actual nucleic acid. So the nucleic acid going in the middle, and then we have our um, capsomeres building on, and then it's just going to keep circling and circling and circling and circling all the way, built up all the way around. This can lead, they can be naked. So they can be naked all on their own and then little rods or something like that. Um, right, so tobacco mosaic virus is their example here, but yeah, they can be naked. They can be like a rod. That's exactly what's going on here. It's just a naked virus. It's a, a nucleocapsid. So the enveloped versions, they can squiggle up inside of a um, envelope. And so they're no longer like rod shaped necessarily. They can, um, be round but they're squiggled up inside of there like all bent up like if you shoved like your shoelace into like a tennis ball or something all right these are talking these are just showing you guys some examples of um naked and enveloped icosahedral viruses i don't need you guys to know too much about it except that they have you know the triangle faces and the spikes and all that around them so we have some very complex capsids, like what we see with a bacteriophage. This is literally what they look like. This is literally what bacteriophages look like. This is literally an actual picture of one, of electron micrograph, but still this is actual real thing. Hold on, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I uh, don't worry. I put it on silent, so it shouldn't be a problem again. That was my husband. But anyways, um, bacteriophages. Man, look at it. It's nuts. Yes, that's what it looks like. What the heck is going on here? Is that even real? Like, I just don't even. How does that happen? Anyways, so these guys are super complicated, right? They've got all these little parts. They've got what you see this here, this sheath part. It looks like it would be like a spring or something. That's because it is. So basically like their tail fibers come into contact with the bacteria, recognizes it, causes it to squat down. These little um, tail pins down here kind of stab into the, like adhere to the surface of the cell stab by stabbing into it physically. And then um, the when that happens, that causes a protein um, shape change in that sheath kind of going, allowing for injection of the actual nucleic acid that's in there. And it literally injects it into the bacteria. And that's how bacteriophage infect. So they don't actually go into bacteria cells. None of the bacteriophages infect the cells like by going into them. Not like us. They inject their genome into the bacteria. That's how they work. So that's why they are shaped the way that they are. And they look nuts. Um, so it's just looking at some non-enveloped and enveloped viruses again, which is just um, got a little bit of color there so you can kind of see the difference and see that capsid that's in there. And you can almost see that icosahedral shape that's going on in there. And this is where the genome is inside of that. So that's our nucleocapsid. And then outside is the envelope. Kind of cool. Okay, so the envelope, usually from the actual host, right? We told We said that that's stolen from the host. Typically, it can be the cell membrane that out the actual cytoplasmic membrane on the outside, or it can be the nuclear membrane. So that'd be the nucleus. So if we are actually um, building our parts in the nucleus and assembling our viruses in the nucleus, then um, you might butt out of the nucleus instead of the outside of the cell, the cytoplasmic membrane. So in this case, we will replace all of the um regular membrane proteins on the outside, we replace all of those with viral proteins. Um, and so now we are just coding ourselves in viral proteins. 
then we have spikes on uh, those glycoproteins, the sugar plus protein that allow for as that work as keys that to allow us to dock and enter into our target cells. Okay, so the genome is uh, DNA and RNA. Um, so uh, in whole, so whenever you are uh, any organism ever, your genome in general is defined as the full complement of DNA and RNA, right? That's carried by the cell. So that's the whole the whole shebang. With viruses, you can have DNA or RNA, but not both. But not both. Okay. Um, their genome can be RNA, but if they have an RNA genome, it's not going to have DNA in there at all. Okay. So when we are a, a virion itself, they are not going to have um, DNA and RNA. It's going to be one or the other. Um, anyway, so moving on. So we can have like 2,500 genes, like what we see with uh, Pandora virus, um, whereas hepatitis B only has four genes. So it just depends on the virus. Um, yeah. They only have enough genes, the exact amount of genes that they need to actually infect and cause, a, you know, build an infection within a host and maintain their infection within a host. So um, they're not going to have like extra bits of DNA, right? So uh, when we're talking about DNA, we, we uh, talk about, you know, uh, DNA being deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA being ribonucleic acid and DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. And that's the usual central dogma of things, right? Positive sense RNA. This is a single stranded RNA. This is how we write this single stranded RNA genome that you can just immediately translate. You can pop it straight into a ribosome and start making proteins. So that's what a positive sense RNA is. A negative sense RNA, you have to make a copy of it into positive sense in order to read the positive sense. So usually you use these guys as a template. That's typically what they're used for. And then um, we'll use them as a template to make positive sense RNA that um, we can read using ribosomes to make proteins and da 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 Okay, so that's the concept of positive and negative sense. You can have a positive sense, a single strand RNA genome, a negative sense, single strand RNA genome, a positive sense, single strand DNA genome, a, a negative sense, single strand DNA genome, or you can have a double stranded DNA, or you can have double stranded RNA. How's that? That's the possibles of all of our um, genomes that we can have. So, um, yeah, so we've got our double-stranded DNA genome. We do our double-stranded DNA to messenger RNA. These guys are single-stranded DNA. These guys will double-strand it, and then we can make messenger RNA from that. So that would be like parvovirus. Uh, if we have double-stranded RNA, these guys um, will convert that down into the messenger RNA, and that will get put into protein, make protein. Uh, these guys are positive sense RNA. So we can just read these straight up in as messenger RNA. Um, or we can make a negative strand template, like it was saying, use this as a means to make a negative sense RNA to make messenger RNA as a template. So you can use it that way as well. It just depends on how that uh, cell is going to be working with it or how the virus wants the cell to work with it. Then we have a, um, a single stranded RNA. <laughs> These guys are gonna uh, go make mRNA based on that. And then a single strand RNA that are reverse transcriptase. That's really good writing, Lauren. Did a good job there. Reverse transcriptase. And what that means is we're going to take our single stranded RNA and turn it into essentially double-stranded DNA, which we can insert into the host genome. Crazy, but that's what HIV does. 
So, um, and then we can make messenger RNA the typical way that we normally would from that. And then we have double stranded DNA, which you might think is just good enough as it is, but it's not for these viruses. Uh, they also have reverse transcriptase. And what they do is they have their double stranded RNA um, and they uh, use that, sorry, they have their double stranded DNA. They can make messenger RNA. And then you're like, well, wait, where's the, you know, reverse transcriptase part? Because they can take their messenger RNA or their, you know, RNA essentially to make DNA back from that. So that can be like their gen genome or whatever. So that can be one way that they deal with that. But anyways, that's a reverse transcriptase and how that works for Hep B. So reverse transcriptase viruses, do remember this, reverse transcriptase viruses, HIV, Hep B. They're important because scientifically speaking, it's massive, massive discovery. Okay. Polymerases are going to make copies of our DNA and our RNA or make RNA from our DNA, whatever it is. These are enzymes that can go in there. Replicases are just going to make RNA to RNA. Uh, reverse transcriptase, that's going to turn us from uh, DNA to RNA. And then we have uh, substances uh, from the actual host cell that we can bring with us. Arena viruses like to pack in host ribosomes and retroviruses like to borrow tRNA. Okay, uh, right. So how do we classify viruses? I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't I don't really care that much about this. <laughs> but um, you know, we have a lot of this is just based on their structure and what um the, their hosts are that they infect and things like that. And so I would be aware of like the last part of these guys. So if you are the order enzyme virales, the family. Viridae, all right? And then your genus is like usually blah, blah, blah virus. And then um, like this one, Lissa virus. Lissa viruses, a type of Lissa virus is rabies virus. So that's the actual species name for these guys, rabies virus. Um, and then, you know, a lot of that depends on this. So I would be aware of virales being order, Viridae being family, and Blavity virus maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm not that worried about it. Okay. So, um, these are going to break these down by DNA and RNA and all that. I am not going to go through that right here, but here they are. These figures are also available in your book, which is online typically for most of you. Um, and you can access it there as well as through the slides that I make available for you guys. But yes, here are viruses and whether they're DNA or RNA and then, you know, their genus and the name of it and all that. Okay, so most viruses live the following cycle, adsorption, penetration, uncoding, synthesis, assembly, and release. We're going to go through each one. Adsorption, this is invasion of the actual um, host. So this is what I was talking about with that lock and key mechanism, where the glycoproteins on the spikes of the actual virus are going to um, fit as a key into the door on the outside of the cell, whatever that door may be for that virus, right? So that is to attach to the cell, is to adsorb, okay? Adsorb. So now we're stuck onto the outside of our cell. Um, uh, viruses are usually, uh, their ability to infect certain cells is determined often by their glycoproteins on the spike. The spikes on the outside of the virions, as well as the actual host protein surfaces. So how those proteins interact with one another, the hosts, surface proteins, and the viral spike proteins, those glycoproteins. They're both glycoproteins, but one's host and one's virus. Um, so yeah, so that determines host range. So some of them have wide and some of them have very specific. So we have a restricted host range. So hep B, only liver cells of humans. That's the only thing it can infect. We're talking about rabies now. My favorite. Rabies, terrifying. These guys infect various cells of all, so not just liver cells or anything like that, various kinds of cells of all mammals. And once those suckers get into your nervous system, you there's no help, hope for you. You die. I'm not kidding. So, 
Um, endocytosis uh, means just like engulfing the particles. So you've adsorbed onto the surface, you stuck on there. Now, how are you getting in the cell fully? Usually you, the cell is either going to engulf you through endocytosis, endo being into, right? And then uh, we're going to undergo uncoding. So the cell engulfs the thing, and then it usually starts digesting immediately with enzymes. Because if it engulfs it, it usually needs to be broken down because it's either bad or it's a food. So we're going to start breaking it down. And that starts um, unle unleashing, uncoding, removing the coverings of your virus so that the actual genome can get free. And that's what it needs in order to reproduce, right? So viral nucleic acid takes control over the host synthetic and metabolic machinery. Um, if your DNA, you will be replicating in the nucleus because that's where DNA stuff happens. So that has to be happening in the nucleus. That's just where the machinery for everything is. RNA or replication is going to be happening in the cytoplasm. So that's the benefit for an RNA virus is you don't need to worry about the nucleus. Um, the DNA does have to you know, be able to get to the nucleus to replicate and everything like that. But I don't know, there's, you can do a lot more with DNA than you can with RNA. So that's just the fact of the matter. Okay. RNA viruses, essentially what we have going on here, we have our spikes attaching in our first step. Uh, two, we're engulfing. That's our penetration. Three, we're uncoding. Whenever the cell starts digesting us and breaking us apart, those enzymes are going to release our actual genome. So this, in this case, we have our RNA genome. So next step is going to be synthesis. So we start making our proteins. So that means capsomeres, right? So we can make a capsid um, and spikes and things like that. So here's our spikes. Here's our capsomeres. We also want to make copies of our genome. So here's our genome. So we've made our negative sense from our positive sense and then our positive copies from all of that. And cool. And so we've got all this stuff going on here. Um, and now we're going to assemble all of these into actual virus particles at the surface here. So we'll put the capsid and start pushing out onto the actual um, membrane, cytoplasmic membrane and start budding out and start pushing out. And that will coat us in um, our spikes that we put on the outside of the cell because that's viruses and that's what they do. And now we have our spikes on us. Um, and now we have our um, capsid, our nucleocapsid pushing into the envelope that it's gonna be covered in, uh, coating in the spikes. Um, and then it will you know, be released, either pinched off or uh, have some sort of enzyme that will allow it to free itself from the surface. So this is, um, yeah, being budding out by release. Now we have our, uh, that's our RNAs. So that all happens in the cytoplasm, right? Cool. So now our DNA viruses. So we have our viral DNA entering the nucleus here. So we've already got our, uh, you know, went through adsorb and all of that. So we've uncoded, got past that point. We're getting our DNA into the nucleus in here. Um, then we will go through transcription. Um, and then that will lead to uh, making our uh, viral mRNA. I was like, where is it? Okay, here it is. So here we are making our viral mRNA, which is in gold. Then you move this guy out into the cytoplasm because that's where your ribosomes are. They're all in the cytoplasm. So we start making our viral proteins, viral protein, viral protein, viral protein. Now we got to bring these suckers back into the nucleus because this is where our DNA copies are getting made. Here's our DNA copies. Here's our replicated viral DNA. So that's all in here. That's all in the nucleus. So now we can package all of that up into the mature virus. So in this case, we have a naked virus, but if you wanted an envelope, you could also bud out of the nuclear um, membrane or the cytoplasm membrane, it just depends on your virus. Anyways, these DNA viruses can incorporate themselves into the host genome, which we mentioned with HIV, which is terrifying, but it is a thing that they do. Here is an example of a virus that does, in fact, replicate in the nucleus. So this is the cell's nucleus here. So this. This is the nucleus, and all that is the rest of the cell. So that shouldn't be that big. <laughs> it's way too big. 
but um, that's the viruses and that's what they're doing. So all these little dots in here, these are all virus particles. And this is just crystalline buildup of the protein that has been laid out by the viruses that it's using as like the capsimer cover and everything like that. So that is insane, but that's um, adenovirus, very common cold um, type virus. Okay, now we're releasing our viruses. So we've already talked about budding. They can also be released by exocytosis, which is where the cell itself is going to be pushing the viruses out. Um, yeah. Uh, so in animals, in um, eukaryotics like us, the uh, viruses are shed this way and we they don't burst out for us typically. Right? But we do sometimes see cytopathic effects. And this just means that you, you can see visible changes in the cell, um, usually negative effects of the cell on the cell uh, due to a viral infection. So that can be due to being coated in viral protein instead of your own proteins that help you like stick to surfaces and stuff like that. So that's, um, that's going to be something you can see, especially in tissue culture, is that they will not be able to attach well anymore. And we also have inclusion bodies, which is just uh, masses of uh, organelles and stuff like that that got damaged due to the viral infection or build up of product from the infection. Then we have syncytia, which is whenever um, cells will be fusing together, usually due again to the um, actual uh, viral proteins on the surface. And they're just fusing with the cell next to them instead of acting in the viral way. So you can see that those are cytopathic effects. Um, persistent infections here, we're talking about proviruses. So we had talked a uh, little bit in the genetic chapter, which I haven't even decided how I'm gonna present to you guys, but um, about uh, prophages and how prophages um, are bacterial, um, like you get infected with a bacterial phage, which we just introduced, right? That's, um, that's a virus for bacteria. And um, they can incorporate their DNA into the viral, into the bacterial genome, right? So we have that too, where we can get infected by a virus and it will insert its DNA into our genome and to make its little house home there. And that is a provirus when it does that. And um, that can lead to a latent state of infection. A lot of times, um, if you have a chronic latent state, really like you get infected and then many, many years later, that virus can come back out of hiding from within that host genome. And that's what we see with like shingles. So that's a good example. Um, you can also have development of cancers by some of these guys, just depending on where they're gonna be inserting and infecting the actual genome of the host. And some of them tend to be more likely to do it than others. Like what we see with HPV, certain strains of it being associated with causing cervical cancer. Um, about 13% of human cancers seem to be caused by viruses in some way. Not all of them are fully understood yet. Transformation is the term where that we use to describe a virus that will um, cause that cell to develop cancer and um, grow kind of unchecked. All right, so the, any virus that infects a bacteria is called a bacteriophage or a phage, okay? Um, Every known bacterial species can be para para parasitized by at least one specific bacteriophage. Um, yeah, a lot of times whenever this happens, this can help the bacteria become more pathogenic to us if they are pathogens. We have uh, bacteriophages that infect E. coli, the T2 and the T4. These are just nuts looking, right? Um, which we've already seen. But this is essentially how they work. They inject their nucleic acid into the cytoplasm of the bacterial cell um, and then go through a similar stages as what animal viruses would, except they, they just don't enter into the cell, right? Here we have a weakened bacterial cell wall that has just been crowded with viruses that are trying to inject their DNA into the bacterium. Okay, we have... Um, Temperate phages. So temperate phage is a phage that will go through lytic and lysogenic, lysogenic cycles. Uh, this is a good picture of this, but let me go to these terms really quick. The lytic phase and the lytic or the lytic cycle, same thing, okay? Lytic phase, the life cycle of bacteriophage that ends in destruction of the bacterial cell, the typical, you know, phage cycle. We also have the lysogenic cycle. This is when bacteriophages become incorporated into the host cell DNA. So this is when they're going to be inserting 
their little phage um, DNA into the bacterial host genome. And um, that would call, we call that a prophage when that happens. So back to this, this is showing us a picture of that. The lytic cycle where you have infection of the E. coli host. So we'll have adsorption, we'll go through the steps, right? Adsorption where it sticks on. Um, it penetrates um, by injecting its genome in. So this little blue squiggly genome. And now the cell will use that genome to make the viral parts, right? So we're making all, all our components to assemble new phages within, they'll mature into phages, and now they bust out of that weakened cell. So they'll start breaking out of that cell. So that's the lytic cycle, typical lytic cycle. However, if they inject their little genome into the bacterium, and this is the normal genome of the bacterium itself, bacterium itself genome plus the actual phage genome here, that is the lysogenic state. Okay, and that's the prophage, that's the, in the blue, prophage here. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, I don't I mean, whatever. So, um, and if it wants to make more uh, viruses or whatever, it can pop back out later if it wants to and go back through the lytic stage, whatever. So, but lysogeny, that is whenever it's incorporated at, it, within the genes genome of the host. And I, how I remember it, because they have to be weird, like similar words, right? So lysogenic, this has gene in it. So we have put our phage into the genome. That's how I remember it. Okay. Um, yes, we, we talked about the prophage. That is the insertion of that uh, viral DNA into the um, bacterial genome. And then we have induction, which is the activation of that prophage that is in a lysogenized cell. And now we're switching back to the lytic cycle. So that's induction. So these, this all occurs with phages that are temperate. Temperate phages can switch between lysogenic and lytic. Lysogenic conversion, that's whenever we have introduction of toxins um, that can be produced by the bacteria as a result of infection with the bacteriophage. The bacteriophage comes in, becomes lysogenic, it, you know, is a prophage you now, inserted its little DNA in there. So we had um, turned lysogenic. Um, and when that happens, imparts uh, toxin, ability to make toxins by the bacteria. So this is very important in medicine. This is how diphtheria gets its toxin. Its toxin. This is how cholera gets its toxin. So botulism gets its toxin. That's pretty crazy for all those. Um, yeah, erythrogenic toxin is a toxin that's produced by streptococcus pyogenes that's involved in uh, scarlet fever. So it gives that typical red rash associated with it. So it's pretty interesting. So here are our stages in our comparisons between bacteriophages and animal viruses. I'm not gonna go through these again because we already talked about them, but this is a great place to compare the two and see what the differences are. So when we're trying to cultivate viruses, it's not the same thing as cultivating bacteria, right? So we can grow bacteria. They're meant to grow by themselves. Viruses cannot grow without growing in a cell. So how do you deal with this? So in vivo methods, we can cultivate um, viruses in animals. In vitro method, we use tissue culture. So it's uh, cells that we've grown up um, typically in a little flask and then um, infect the flask with the virus and grow them that way. So we can use animals for um, live animal inoculation for growing and studying viruses. This would include using mice, rats, hamsters, guinea pigs, rabbits. These are typical for just growing up virus. If you're studying infection, you're typically going to be um, using um, monkeys, uh, primates, and um, then studying um, the effects on them. But this is for cultivation is what I'm talking about. So these are the uh, sites for viral exposure. That's a nice way of, I guess, saying that. I don't know. But yeah, this is where you would be injecting the virus into these animals um, in their brains directly, their blood, their muscles, um, themselves, uh, body cavities. 
usually in the abdomen, um, skin, and in the foot pads. It's awful, but it's the way it is. So bird embryos, you know, this is sort of like living tissue that allows us to look at the effects and allow virus to grow in living cells, but without dealing with a living animal. It's also self-containing, self-supporting unit. So that's uh, going to be maintained relatively sterile as well. Um, so yeah, tissue culture, most viruses nowadays are going to be propagated through tissue culture. That's the best way to do so. This is what they did with um, COVID. This is why everybody was saying that it was using you know, babies, which isn't true. I'll tell you guys now that what it was using were um, probably HEK 293 T cells, which are human embryonic kidney cells. And you might be sitting there saying embryonic kidney cells, Lauren, duh, that is babies. So dead babies. Yeah, dead babies from like the 50s, and we're just propagating these cells and using them. They're already, we're not killing new ones each time. So get out of that right now. So that's not how that works. Um, we can propagate these cells indefinitely. They are immortalized, literally. Um, they're essentially cancer, but they allow us to grow things like viruses and study them without having to kill anything. So that's the idea of, and it's much, much easier to deal with that than it is with animals. So um, very useful cell culture, very, very useful. Maintaining them, yes, very uh, labor intensive, but better than animals. All right, primary cultures. This is essentially like you took it fresh from an organism, um, often like from an organ, from an organism um, and creating uh, those cells uh, to grow your culture in. But then we have those continuous cell, cell cultures that are immortalized somehow, typically have um, abnormal chromosome numbers. Um, they grow fast. They don't behave like those the normal version of those cells do um, and that sort of stuff. But they'll grow essentially forever. Then we can also look at plaques, especially if we are going to be looking at um, for bacterial cells. And you can do this a little bit with um, like human cells, it's just, you would be looking for clearings in a lawn of human cells, but we don't see that as much as you just see them spread out evenly. So in bacteria though, if you are plating out a lawn of bacteria and have the viruses mixed with that, then you have clearly well-defined patches within the cells. That's very common within bacterial cultures, looking at bacteriophages. So you can see that in um, eukaryotic cells as well. Um, yeah, so obviously viruses cause disease. I mean, I feel like that's what the slide is saying. It, yes. <laughs> yeah, some are worse than others. Okay, uh, when we're trying to have uh, therapies against viruses. There is something called interferon and interferon is a normal thing that can be signaled from cell to cell. Essentially, it's like your neighbor telling you that he's getting robbed so you need to get your shotgun out and get ready. That's essentially what interferon does for cells. It lets them know, hey, you're getting ready to get infected. Um, I am, so you should probably prepare. I'm gonna let you know ahead of time, buddy, neighbor, good old neighbor. So that's essentially what um, interferon does with cells normally. Um, so it's a naturally occurring cell product and we can use it to treat uh, viral infections to try to kind of wake up your cells to start fighting against uh, the infection ahead of time. Just get ready for it. Okay, we have some things that can cause infections that do not, that are not uh, viruses and they are not bacteria and they are not archaea and they are not um, eukaryotes. They're none of the above. These are non-living, um, non-cellular infectious agents. This includes um, the disease known as spongy form encephalopathy. So these are subacute encep encephalitis. They are chronic and persistent um, diseases in humans as well as animals. They seem to occur naturally and they can also be communicable. Um, brain tissue um, that is removed from people who are suffering from or animals that are suffering from uh, spongy form encephalitis, encephalopathies. Um, these guys uh, have a like literally like a spongy looking brain, like with holes through it and especially in um, the grooves on, on top. 
So um, a lot of that gets uh, overpronounced. So this, these are caused by prions. Um, we often find these associated with spongiform encephalopathies. We are not sure how they work or how they operate, but the concept is it tends to be, I'm gonna sneeze. It seems to be associated with a misfolded protein. And these misfolded proteins like come along, like if you're supposed to be um, folded like this, and they come along, normal, 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 and the misfolded guys come along and touch it. And now it turns into this. And now um, it goes on and touches another one and it turns into that and it spreads that way. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut, but um, there's this stuff called Ice Nine. And whenever it gets unleashed, it turns all of the water to ice instantly. Um, that's IS-9 and, uh, it's like the preferred confirmation of the water. That's the theory in the, in the book anyways, but super cynical, um, if you like that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, sorry. I lost my prion. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So they kind of aggregate after that and seem to aggregate anyways and cause holes in the brain, but we're not exactly sure what causes it originally or like why or how it's um you know uh, spread but that's yeah okay so gradual degeneration and death will happen um, this is the human version this is Creutzfeldt Jakob disease so this is the human version and there are other um, animals that can have this like uh cows have a BSE which is mad cow disease and then we have scrapie in sheep mink and elk so it's also pretty pretty similar to that um and like uh deer have um chronic wasting disease it's a similar concept very slow um but typically once you start having obvious symptoms pronounced symptoms you have a, less than a year to survive but it takes like you know 30 years to start having symptoms it's nuts so the exact mode of infection again not completely understood just seems like you can come in contact with this misfolded protein and it can lead to symptoms from this. Um, this actually, yeah, completely changed our idea of what constitutes an infectious agent and what you need in order to be infectious. We also have satellite viruses. These guys um, have to come along with other viruses. Um, so they would depend on infection by those other viruses in order for them to replicate. So adeno-associated virus, obviously it is uh, associated with adenovirus. So infection with adenovirus, and you almost always find AAV associated with adenovirus as well. So they're usually hand in hand pretty consistently. Um, then we have the um, viroids. These guys are um, naked strands of RNA. They lack a capsid. They lack any coding whatsoever. They're just RNA. They're just RNA, just chilling. So a lot of plant pathogens are like this. So that's it for our viruses and our other infectious particles. Um, so one of the questions, the question of the day or question of the chapter that I'm going to leave you guys with this time, why is it impossible to know how many viruses exist in general? So um, yeah, thanks for coming.